Kuma Media's Policy Amtabi Madiba, award winning ground up journalist Marisha Dimons and Daniel Stein, joins me to unpack their co authored book titled The Tabo Besta Story. The Facebook Rapist, The Celebrity Doctor, and The Escape from South 35. Tabo Besta was arrested along with his partner and celebrity doctor, Nandipa Magudumana. Besta had become known as the Facebook rapist because he used the platform to lure models with fake job opportunities. Daniel, tell us about your experience working on the Tabo Besta story and how did it feel breaking such a big story? Sure, I think this year has been um, one of the most surreal experiences of my life. <laughs> I was um, assigned to the story in February of this year. About um, five weeks later, we broke the story on, on Tabu Besta's escape. And since then, it's just been a whirlwind of um, you know, follow-up stories, uh, interviews. We have written a book. Um, you know, so the, um, the whole experience has been surreal. Um, but it, all in all, it's been a, a great experience and a great learning curve as well. Please give us a brief timeline of Besta's escape from the Mangaung prison. Sure, so the escape took place on the 3rd of May 2022. A few days before the escape, Dabu Besta was moved into a single cell um, in, a, in the corner of the prison where CCTV cameras couldn't properly see into it. This is an area of the prison that um, if inmates are fearing for their safety or have concerns about their safety, they can apply to be moved into these segregation units um, for a set period of time. So Tabo Besta's um, reason was that he was fearing the number gangs um, and that he didn't have money to pay them off, so that's why he had to be moved to the prison. Prior to that, Dr. Nandipa Magudumana had claimed a body from the state morgue in Bloemfontein, but that body was found to not be suitable to be used as a decoy in the escape and the body was then thrown into a river in Bloemfontein. Meanwhile a fake uh, funeral was held and a coffin was buried with Burevors inside of it. Um, and then she claimed a second body, that of Katlejo Bering, um, from the National Hospital in Bloemfontein. And that body was then, so once again a fake funeral was held, this time Milipap was, was buried and the body itself was then taken to um, the prison where it was taken to Besta cell. It was covered in petrol, set alight um, in the early hours of, of the 3rd of May and, and Besta uh, walked out of the prison dressed in the prison warden's uniform. And from what we have learned, Daniel, is that Besta benefited from the incompetence of the police and the country's justice system. He should have been caught long before 2011. So what can you say about the police and the Department of Correctional Services' response to the Besta's escape? Sure, it's difficult to know where to begin because um, so, so on the 3rd of May 2022 when this fire happened, um, it was Im immediately assumed that it was Besta's body that was found in the cell and that he had committed suicide by setting himself alight. That then spurred an investigation into a suicide. Um, the Department of Correctional Services started investigating, as well as the police, and the Judicial Inspectorate for Correctional Services also launched an investigation. They investigate any unnatural death in a prison in South Africa. A few days after that, they got the autopsy reports, which showed that the body was dead before the fire broke out, meaning that the body was seemingly murdered. Um, so they then started investigating a murder. It's difficult to know what exactly they were doing then, since then, um, between then and March 2023, when we forced them to have to admit that Tabo Best had escaped. Because we know that by July, at least, and possibly even earlier, the police and the Department of Correctional Services knew Firstly, that the body was dead before the fire broke out from the autopsy report. Secondly, that Nandipa Magudamana was involved because she had brought a court case to have the body returned to her after she claimed it and it was confiscated from her. Thirdly, that the DNA of Bester's biological mom did not match the body. So they knew this by July, at least. We've seen police documentation that shows that. By August, the police told the Department of Correctional Services and the Judicial Inspectorate that they strongly believed Bester had escaped. 
um, and still there was little action. There was no task team set up to try and track and trace Bester. There was no in informing of Bester's victims, which is a law that when a convicted rapist escapes that their victims need to be informed. Um, and there was very little further action taken. And Justice Cameron, as the inspecting judge of correctional services, um, became increasingly frustrated with how things were going and decided then to reach out to his friend and colleague uh, Nathan Geffen, who's our editor at Ground Up, and told him that investigations into this was looking, were, were taking uh, long and that there are rumours and indications that they still escaped. Um, and I, I think the initial thinking of uh, from Ground Up's point of view was that just by asking questions and writing some small articles about the investigation into the escape that would put pressure on the government to take action and to to come clean but they didn't respond to ground ups media queries properly they um, continued to to drag their feet in the investigations and then by February this year when I was assigned to the story a ground up was taking was was realizing that it was going to be ground ups role to to expose this and by then we had, um, we had, there were several sources that had made contact with us, uh, prison sources, um, people close to Marco Domana, and Justice Cameron had given us further information which then um, enabled us to, to write the story. Um, and what we found when we, when we wrote that story on, and published that story on the 15th of March, it still took two weeks for the government to admit that Tabo Best had escaped. And we found that we found them completely sleeping at the wheel. Um, that investigations, that a draft investigation report had been completed in November last year, but um, was hadn't been finalised because of contractual implications with G4S. Um, those fake funerals of the two bodies, so the Milipap and the Burovos, those coffins were only exhumed after we had written our, our article. So real proper police investigation only happened much later. And it was only about a week or two after our report that the Department of Correctional Services put together a task team, um, a multidisciplinary, multi-departmental task team, of people from the Hawks, the police, Department of Correctional Services to track and trace Tabu Besta. And less than a month later, Tabu Besta was back in jail. Talk to us about the role whistleblowers played in helping you tell the Tabo Besta story. Mm. So I've mentioned Justice Edwin Cameron, and um, you know I think he's he's come into a lot of criticism um, from from his colleagues. Many of his colleagues were not sure that um, it was the right thing to do uh, to go to the media. Um, members of Parliament have said maybe you should ra you should have rather come to Parliament um, rather than going to the media. And then obviously the fact that he's a board member of Ground Up and that he has a friendship with our editor, people are, uh, um, are skeptical of that. And I hope that we've proven that, that we've had enough separation between um, Justice Edwin Cameron and his role as the Judicial Inspector of Correctional Services and us as journalists. Um, for example, we never, Marisha and I never spoke to Justice Cameron throughout the whole investigation uh, personally. Everything came through Nathan, most of it was off the record, so not we couldn't use it. We had to. It was just kind of breadcrumbs pointing us in the right direction of where to find answers and so on. So um, all in all, I think there was a very important, uh, trustful relationship between Justice Cameron and and us, um, where we understood the boundaries of our involvement um, and the relationship. And um, at the end of the day, I think he played a crucial role in in exposing this and w without him blowing the whistle, uh, Tabo Besta might still be on the loose. Um, and there were other uh, whistleblowers as well, for example a prison warden who, um, who contacted us, who was themselves facing um, allegations of being involved in the escape. And they provided important information and I think, my, you know, my impression is that they did it not out of self-preservation to, to save their own uh, backside, but in order to do the right thing, um, and that's encouraging to see that um, both at the highest level, that uh, former constitutional court judge, and at a lower level, a, a prison warder who who doesn't earn a lot of money, um, were 
were driven to to blow the whistle um, on this case. Yeah. Why was there a delay in investigating Debo Holipolo, the CCTV technician at Mangawu Correctional Centre, after he handed himself to the police? So at Mangawu uh, Correctional Centre, um, you have a private company running the, the operations. And throughout um, the police and Department of Correctional Services and the Judicial Inspectorate um, investigating this escape, G4S, which runs the prison, was very um, cagey about how much information they give. Um, you know, they claim that until earlier this year they still believed it was Tabu Pester in the cell and that it was not their mandate to investigate the escape. It was just their mandate to, to investigate where policies and procedures went wrong. And that shows the difficulty um, and the lack of transparency um, in the running of, of the prison um, and the inability then of the government to, to play proper oversight. And we see that in Tobo Lipolo's case. So um, Lipolo was a, mem a staff member of Integratron Security Solutions, which is a subcontractor, um, a company that maintains the CCTV system at the prison. And um, basically what we now know Lipolo did was um, in the days leading up to the escape and on the day itself um, went and pulled the power plug of the CCTV system, meaning that the CCTV cameras did not record the activities around the escape. Um, the state also alleges that, um, that Lipolo uh, actually took the body into the cell um, so played an active hand in the escape itself. And so after the fire, th there was an investigation launched, as I said, and G4S did its investigation. It says about how policies and procedures were not followed. And Integratron Security Solutions also did an investigation. Lepolo himself was one of the members of this investigating team. And the investigation made no findings against Lepolo and attributed everything to technical errors. Um, and it was only in March, after we had written our report, our article exposing the escape, and um, the Department of Correctional Services realized that they need to um, do further investigation, that um, Integraton Security Solutions woke up and realized, well, they say that's only, that's only the point when they realized, uh, that Lipolo um, had pulled the plug on the CCTV and all of this. So they then subjected him to a, a polygraph test, which he failed. And before the, the test, in the corridor, talking to his translator, so the person translating the questions for, for him during the, the polygraph test, he admitted everything to the translator about what he, that he had received money, that he knows who has received money, um, other people have received money for for this escape to to happen. So Integratron then had um, the failed polygraph test and a, a sworn affidavit from this translator saying what had happened. And Lipolo then realised that. Um, that he's going to, that he's been caught red-handed, and he then handed himself over to police, to um, and admitted everything, and then now he's facing criminal charges. Um, so why was there a delay? Because of lack of transparency, because of private companies trying to protect themselves, um, and because of incompetence by correctional services and the police to properly investigate what happened. Um, on the night of the fire. Marisha, why do you think that Besta was so effective at influencing and scamming people and what role was played in this by Tom Matsepe? So based on the information that the victims had shared with us who had personally encountered him, um, he seemed to be some sort of a persuasive character. He knew exactly what to say. Um, if I think of the Tom Utsipe character that eventually came to the forefront, um, Bester definitely did his homework. So he knew the media industry in and out and very prominent individuals in the media industry actually were aware of Tom Utsipe. And I think just looking at that, it, it, it just shows that all you need to do is do enough homework and make sure that the right people know your name 
so that if if you want to scam people or present something that otherwise people might have considered to be uh, a red flag if you just sound the part and you look the part you can basically get away with anything and what do you think drove Nandi Pamakudumana to risk everything for a convicted murderer and rapist boyfriend? And if convicted Marisha for helping Besta escape, what is at stake for Magudumana? Mm. I think Magudumana is one of those characters where there is a massive question mark on her involvement in this. Um, I think if we look at Magudumana's background, you know, starting off as this uh, medical doctor, she was this influencer, um, she had her own aesthetics clinic, and she has this rags to riches upbringing and story which a lot of South Africans can identify with. Um, she was also a wife, a mother to two beautiful daughters and she really seemed to have her life together. Um, I think if, if I go back to the initial investigation stages of when I first became aware of her involvement, um, after doing a quick Google search of Mother Dumana, I thought that there's absolutely no way that this is the woman who um, went and collected best a supposed body um, but my theory is that perhaps Magudumana was also lured in by Bester's charm um, and scams in the same way that he had scammed um, other victims so he, he seeing that he did seem to follow the same modus operandi it, it, it's very likely that he did the same with Magudumana where she had invested a lot of money and perhaps when she had seen the light and figured out who and what he really was she might have been in too deep and invested too much and knowing that uh, well based on what the victims have shared that Bester is a manipulative character it is very likely that from the time that he had lured Magadumana into his potential scams um, up until her being involved he might have um, manipulated her said sweet words to her and and perhaps she she really did find some sort of love or, or relationship with with Bester's character and I mean maybe she thought that she could change him and that's why she had held on to it there, there, there are speculations that there might be some form of pathology with Magudumana which I think could be the only explanation as to why she'd be willing to risk so much and put so much um, on the line just for a convicted rapist and murderer. That was Marisha Dimons and Daniel Stain speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about the Tabo Besta story.